Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I'm excited to be here with Tara Davina. And we're going to talk about uh, all things music career as far as how to make yourself stand out, how to actually make money from music, you know, all the things that we love talking about on this show from her unique perspective. So I'm excited to get into all of this. Uh, But before we do, I'd love to have you, Tara, just let us know a little bit about your background, how you got involved in music, how you got to what you're doing today as a music coach. Great question. And it's a bit of a long answer. That's okay. Um, That's what podcasts are for. It's fun to like hear the deep dish stories, you know? Oh, good. Good. I'm so glad. I love telling this story. It's such a fun one. Um, so I was in my third year of university. I was on a business track and that would have had me, you know, be a product manager at Coca-Cola or something like that, you know? <laughs> and um, at some point I realized, uh, I don't think I want to do that. And so I looked deep within what is it I really want to do? Um, And the only thing I could come up with was, well, I love music. I've been studying music. Maybe I could do something in the music industry. And I let people know. And they all said, well, that's impossible. You don't know anybody. Of course they did. Yeah. You don't know anyone. You're Canadian. Like, where do you think you're going to go? You know, it's not going to happen. And I ignored them, thankfully. Good job. And it was right around the time that email was becoming a thing. And, um, I emailed um, 300 record labels, just random all over, wherever I could find a record label with an email address. I sent them an email, said, listen, I'd like to come intern for you. Will you have me? I got two replies out of 300. And one of them was from London Sire Records, which is a Warner Music Group company in New York City or was. And uh, that was famously Madonna's label. And... uh, they took me in and said, come help us. We don't know anything about this internet marketing thing, Mm. websites, et cetera. Um, And so as a college kid, I got to go basically run the new media department and they didn't want to let me go. So I stuck around and um, that began my illustrious and challenging career in the music industry. Um, which went on for, uh, you know, in that form as a corporate label executive for about 10 years. And I finished where I started, which was at the Warner Music Group, um, back at their independent record label distributor. And during my time, I got to do things like help ink deals with some of the original um, digital service providers like Apple and Spotify and all those horrible deals that us artists now um, get to be... um, (laughs) Get to be beholden to. I helped create. Amazing. Um, and so I did that all for about 10 years and I had a pretty successful career. I was a vice president by the time I was 26. Um, wow. Turn, turned out internet stuff was useful knowledge in the early 2000s. And uh, I was really in the right place at the right time. And I had kind of had it all. And um, one day I just realized that I would actually rather just die than come back into the office for another day. (laughs) So is this like just one day or like you've been feeling like this kind of discomfort, this kind of burnout. And then one day it just ahead or it was just like one day, all of a sudden you had this epiphany. Yeah. So I, I had a lot of burnout already. And then what happened was I, I, um, the company I was working for shut down which, which kept happening, of course, over the years. They were all, so many of the labels were consolidating. Mm. 
Um, and so I was like, that's it. I'm going to go into neuropsychiatry. Like I'm done with this stuff. And then I got this final offer from the Warner music group. That was too good to pass. I just couldn't pass it up. I was like, whatever, even if I want to become a neuropsychiatrist, like I should probably do this for a couple of years and just enjoy myself. Um, and so I took this one final role and I just, I was at such a transition point in my life in general, where all I knew was the corporate world, the corporate life. And I started to look at the state of the people that I was, um, whose footsteps I was following in, um, the head of the company, the people that were grooming me for their roles. And they all looked so unhappy mm. and so miserable. And so they, their relationships were failing. They weren't happy in their lives. They were working 24 seven drinking and not eating healthy and not getting any sleep. And I just, I was suddenly aware that I didn't want that for myself, you know, and um, I'd completely lost sight of the fact that the reason I went into the music business was because I love music. You know, I wasn't playing any music or really interfacing with music. I was really deep in on the corporate side of things. And so it just all came to a head. I, um, I, I went to a little, little festival called Burning Man in 2008. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, for anyone who's from the Bay area, that might not sound like such a big deal, but when you're from East coast, Canada originally, and, um, you've never experienced such things, things like Burning Man are very revelatory. And, uh, it really opened my eyes to the possibility that I could actually love my career and love what I do and not just do something where it looked good on the surface on paper, where I was paid well and had a wonderful title and amazing status and was surrounded by celebrities. I could actually be fulfilled. Mm. And once I caught a glimpse of that, it was all over for me. And I walked away with no plan, no idea what I was going to do next and um, no idea what was in store for me. And I did what every new hippie does, which is I packed my bags and moved north to the Bay Area. And um, the rest is history. I, um, <laughs> I found my way back to being a musician. Um, I wound up in a place where I'm now mentoring other people around creativity and loving their career and it's been a long road since that fateful day 12 years ago where I walked off the job, but a really um, fulfilling and deep and um, rewarding road. Wow. That's really cool. And, you know, I think it's so relevant right now. I think that this whole pandemic experience has been such a pattern interrupt for a lot of us. And like you experienced, like allowing you to really explore, like, if I stay on this path, am I really going to be happy? And, you know, what do I need to actually feel like I have a purpose and feel fulfilled? And I know you really like to talk about and that and like, what are, what are some of the things that you really need to prioritize to figure out what is going to make you fulfilled and in, in, in your life and what's going to give you real purpose in your work? Yeah, it's a great question. I think the, the most fundamental piece is getting clear on what you don't want. Mm as a start, like getting really clear on your yes and your no. And most people are surprisingly unclear on these things. And most of us, I should say, are surprisingly unclear on our yeses and our no's. And that internal compass that lets us know if we're on the right track for us or not. And there's so many things that can get in the way of that. Like, what will other people think? Will I be judged? Um, is this even possible? There's so many um, social constructs and mindset issues that can really interrupt our capacity to tune in deeply with our inner truth. And so the key is to understand how to go beyond that and really have a consistent connection to that sense of direction that we each have all the time. Mm. Well, so why do you think that we're, there's a lot of unhappiness in, in the world? Like you said, you were looking at the people ahead of you 
and seeing, wow, they really weren't happy with their life. And, you know, why do you think that they were just kind of stuck on that track and how can we kind of pull ourselves out of that? And where does creativity fall into that? Mm. I love this question. I think that when we don't know anything different, we don't have any examples of anything different. Mm. Our mind won't naturally think of another option. And for most people, the idea of being a record label executive is very creative and edgy and non-standard path, you know? So I think for a lot of these record label executives whose footsteps I did not wish to follow in, they had done something off the beaten path in their mind. Um, and, and I will say some of them did go on to quit the industry and, and like start um, following their passion. I did see that in the later years. And I think that in general, as a meme in our culture right now, following our heart and following our path of creativity is actually becoming more acceptable, Mm -hmm. more accepted. It's a lot more common now than it was 20 years ago. Like it used to be 20 years ago, if you were an entrepreneur doing your own thing, you know, you were, this was groundbreaking. You Mm -hmm. know, this is very only for a unique subset of people. And nowadays I think, more and more people are subscribing to the idea that it is in fact possible to be self-made. And there's a a shift in the collective consciousness around what's possible. And because it's more and more visible, like, you you know, you go on YouTube or TikTok or Facebook and there's what's in your face are a bunch of entrepreneurs telling you about a new side hustle or how to follow your passion. Like the meme is shifting so much. And I think that is what is making it possible for people to um, open up to this idea of being um, self-directed. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially over the past five years, probably. Um, I think the thing that is hard is that they talk about all the sexy stuff, right? Oh, you have, you know, time freedom and flexibility and you can do what you want when and all that. And you, you can make your own schedule. But if you're not, someone that's ever done that before, you can almost feel like totally overwhelmed and drowned by that when you're actually put into that place, because you're used to having someone to tell you to do, you know, what to do when, right? Have you experienced that? I mean, I was in corporate too. So when I first became an entrepreneur, I was like, oh, I like actually have to be my own boss. Like I have to like set deadlines for myself and tell myself what to do and make lists and things like that. 100%. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was always really autonomous. So that side of things, like getting myself to um, follow through on what I set forth for myself, that was fine. What was hard was dealing the fear and the resistance that comes up around putting myself out there. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't so much like, oh, getting myself to do the work, which a lot of us, some people need somebody to tell them what to do and to be managed. I was never that person but putting my own stuff out there, putting my own name on things and risking being seen in failure, that was really tough. And I think most people underestimate the power of our desire to be seen as successful um, and how much that can really interrupt the creative process of being an entrepreneur. Oh yeah, I, I, I definitely agree. And especially I think artists that are listening really identify with that. I was just talking with my Academy members and they were saying, you know, it's, it's so uncomfortable to, to put yourself out there and to, to make yourself the brand, right? Because then you feel like everything is revolving around you and you don't want that, especially as an artist, you want it to be about your music, right? So how do you, how do you navigate that while still getting the attention that you want to get? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. For me, the answer on this one has always been core message. And, you know, I believe we all have a core message, which is something that we're here to transmit. Like we're a beacon of light on a particular topic. Mm. And this usually comes through in our music. You know, for a musician or an artist, like this is, it's on full display in our art. But sometimes we can forget that. And if we are able to remember what that is and continue to speak about it in our marketing and utilize it in our branding, it can create a really consistent flow between our marketing and our art where we don't have to feel like we're 
faking it in some way or compromising or selling out. Um, it's actually our marketing can become a real extension of our art. Mm, yeah, I definitely agree with that. And it, it takes work. From my experience working with musicians, it takes work for them to make that connection and to like really dig into like what they're willing to talk about and and just coming up with kind of like stories and things like that, that relate to their music that they're able to talk about. Like a lot of times artists are able to like spill their guts in their songs, <laughs> but it's really hard to like also do that even from stage or on a live stream or in, in the, even in their, you know, social media posts. Have you experienced that? Um, I think again, where I have seen that it's been because they just weren't the artist wasn't clear on what their message actually was. What, what mm -hmm. I've noticed is once people, once we get clear on what that is, it's almost like we're a, um, a fountain that's overflowing. Like we can't mm -hmm. stop the flow of energy from coming out. Like it's impossible to say enough about the topic, but until that's clarified, it can be really hard for a lot of artists. Like they can feel clammed up and like they have nothing to say or like it's forced. Um, but I do find that, clarifying that core message is the key that unlocks the flow and the ease of being able to speak about the art. That's really cool. I love that idea of them being a fountain that's overflowing. Do they, do they ever come to you and say like, are people going to get sick of me talking about the same thing over and over again? A hundred percent. Like we all forget that we're just um, a bit player in everybody else's show right. in which they're the star. And so we think, Oh, I've already said this like a hundred times. But it's really only on the hundredth time that people really hear us and get it. And we forget that um, people are just glancing at what we have to say most of the time, or they're just taking it in a little bit. And the more we can say things in different ways from different angles and repeat ourselves, the more we're going to get our message across. And that's actually what brands are essentially just broadcasting the same thing over and over and over again until we begin to associate that thing with the brand, until we begin to associate certain emotions, feelings, thoughts with that brand. And for artists, it's exactly the same way. It's like the more we broadcast that message, the more we broadcast our brand, which is the message, the more people will start to associate us with that and want to join the movement by being part of the art, listening to the music, going to the shows, et cetera. Yeah. And I, I assume that you would also say that like, this is how they can stand out in a crowded market. Cause I mean, I, I was just talking again with my Academy members this morning and some of them were saying like, there's just so much music out there. I feel like I'm just like a number, you know? So how can they really stand out? Obviously like what we we're just talking about, you know, having that core message, is there anything else they can do to really stand out? Cause there are like the internet is even the playing field, right? There's, musicians popping up every second. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, core message is all about bringing more of ourself out. And I think that not only is that about the message itself, but it's also about bringing forth the things that we think people won't like us for. Mm -hmm. So one way to stand out as an artist is to be more transparent about our truth, about what's going on, our weaknesses, our strengths, etc. Um, really owning the things that make us who we are, you know? So um, if an artist has had a particular struggle, you know, like maybe, maybe an artist who I'm just thinking of other clients and people that work with an artist that has really challenging ADHD, like really owning that and being like, I'm the ADHD artist, you know, so <laughs> an artist who really loves, um, smoking weed, you know, like owning that, like, this is what I do, you know, like an artist who loves psychedelics, an artist who loves Jesus, like whatever it is, like those things that you think will turn off certain people, but they will, they will right. turn certain people off, but they're going to turn on your real fans so much, you know? And so by hiding those things, um, you're hiding what's going to have people love you. And the reality is that we have to accept that who we are is inherently polarizing and we're never going to have everybody love us. And so it's really important to recognize that. And uh, instead of trying to make everybody love us, which will result in kind of a bland, forgettable 
um, presentation of ourselves to allow people to really love us who, for who we actually are, no holds barred, nothing held back. And that's really what makes artists or really any entrepreneur stand out in the marketplace is ownership of all the things that, um, especially the things that seem shameful. Mm. Mm, I love that. So if we're able to really make ourselves stand out and we're attracting those super fans, how can artists, in your opinion, best make income from their music? Great question. So as we know, it can be harder and harder to make money from streams and from, well, album sales are pretty much over. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it can be hard to generate a lot of cash unless you're really well, unless you're, you know, getting millions of plays. And then you can actually make a respectable living from that. But until that day comes, um, I believe there's other ways of doing it that make a lot more sense. So number one, I highly recommend to artists crowdfunding campaigns. I think that they're incredibly, if it, when done correctly, it's an incredible way to leverage the enthusiasm of your fans and supporters um, into financial results. And it can, there's so many cool creative things that one can do with a crowdfunding campaign. Like um, for example, my most recent crowdfunding campaign from my album raised $15,000 total. And I did that in just a few weeks. And the way that I did that was I decided like, okay, what are all my favorite things? The things that inspire me when I'm writing music, the things that I use every day, the things that I love the most, um, clothing, beauty products, et cetera. Um, and then I reached out to those people and I saw, um, asked if they wanted to participate by donating products to the campaign in exchange for promotion. Mm -hmm. And of course they were so excited to be able to reach my audience. And, if, and I'm an enthusiastic fan of these things, you know, so it's not even just, that I'm saying here, get this thing. It's like, oh, I love this thing. It's my favorite thing. Here's why. Meanwhile, the people donating are so excited because they get to receive something really exciting that feels like a piece of me or something that I love um, and get to support the music at the same time. And of course, you know, it, it takes a long time to generate 15K through streaming revenue or through album sales these days. So it's a really helpful kickstart for um, making an album, which is what I put it towards, you know, it was, um, the production and the, the playing the musicians for this album that I'm in the process of releasing. And so that's number one. I just think it's a really easy, um, immediate way to generate funds to at least, you know, to fund projects, to ensure that there is some income and ROI on an album. Um, number two, I think it's just getting really creative, like looking at all of our skill sets as an artist and seeing how they can be useful to other people. So as an example, um, a music artist who writes really poignant lyrics could be making, you know, who is, who's also a visual artist could be making beautiful memes or um, products with the lyrics against a gorgeous backdrop that then gets printed on a t-shirt or a pillow or a blanket or, you know, like, there's so many print on demand services these days. There's so many ways to get seen and visible on Instagram and Pinterest, et cetera. Like there's a lot of other ways to get super creative in selling our art. And I think when we get out of the idea of being pigeonholed into, I have to make money from the music itself, mm -hmm. then so much opens up. And it's one of my favorite things to do is to sit down with an artist and brainstorm all the ways that would be fun for them and exciting for them to generate income right now using art. Mm. And it's really, there are infinite possibilities. I love that. Yeah. And so true. They don't have to be focused just on the music. And I think that's a lot of where artists get stuck. Like the music can be like the gateway or it can be like the bridge, you know, between them and the thing that they actually want to sell. Like really nowadays, merch is the way you're going to make money. You're not going to be selling a ton of CDs, although people still will buy them. If there's, if they see you live, I still see this happening, but you know, merch really, you need to like use the music to bridge with the merch in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Merch and services. Mm, services. Absolutely. 
you know, helping other people with their creativity, offering, uh, you know, uh, custom music to people, offering custom music guidance to people. There's, again, it's like there's truly infinite ways to monetize our creativity. It's just a matter of being willing to get creative. Right. And whatever your talents are. I mean, if you're good at design, like I was just talking to one of my students today and they were like, oh, I love branding. I love design. You should be helping musicians with that because if you're like me, you're terrible at that stuff and you need someone to help you, you know, and, and you've got the, the music angle. So why not do that or help, help people make album art? You know, there's, there's so many, like you said, so many ways to get creative like that. And I love that you mentioned the, the, about crowdfunding. Um, you did it so easily and quickly in a short amount of time, people think crowdfunding, they think 90 day, like super complicated, like way too many tiers kind of thing. And I'm always like, how can we make this easy and fun? And that's exactly what you said the way you did it, which I think was really smart. It's almost like a combination between like influencer marketing and a crowdfunding. Absolutely. And I've all, like, I've done multiple crowdfunding campaigns over the years, you know, both for myself and guiding my clients. And every time I've seen it, it's all about the perks. You know, it's like you get great perks when you're not only collaborating with someone else, but then it's available to promote your campaign and bring in another audience but you're giving your audience something fun to participate with. I think when we start to present ourselves as a charity case, um, give me money, I need it, I'm a starving artist, people are less excited to support that. And when we really bring in amazing perks and amazing incentives to participate, um, it presents a much more exciting and fun thing to be a part of. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that about the charity case thing. Cause I saw way too much of that during the beginning of the pandemic. And it just was like a downer. Like you didn't, I, I get it. Like you're struggling. Okay. But you can't present yourself as struggling. That's not attractive. And it, yeah. And you, and people really want to like donate to something, which is why I love the crowdfunding angle or even a Patreon angle. If it has like a very specific outcome, of what you're doing because they feel like, oh my gosh, I'm contributing to this thing and it's being created and I help create it. Yeah, absolutely. It's so much more fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, this has all been really awesome. Is there anything else you'd like to, to tell people, um, the listeners that we didn't cover yet today? There's so many different directions I could <laughs> go in. <laughs> my brain is dealing with infinity right now. Um, just that, you know, there's always a way if you're willing to think a little bit differently and get a little creative. And I, I would just say, if you're ever stuck and you feel like you're hitting a wall over and over again, the best recommendation I can give you is to get support. Support can come in so many forms. You know, it could come in the form of getting someone to assist you with reaching out to people to get on their playlists, you know, which is one of my very favorite ways to increase listenership for music. Um, it could be about getting some mentorship to just sit with you and, and think with you about the different ways that you could make money. Because I see so many people getting stopped because they think they're not going to like the option. They're like, well, I, I'm going to be stuck being a piano teacher or mm -hmm. sorry, no offense to anyone that loves being a piano teacher. But for some reason, I get people complain the most about the prospect of having to teach music. It's like the jail cell for mm -hmm. a musician trying to make money. And just know that like, that's not the only option. There are so many options that don't require any compromise of your artistic integrity that don't require that you stoop down to doing something you don't want to do. It's like, you could have an exciting, abundant, fulfilled life, being creative and making your art. Um, even if you can't see it right now, even if you don't know the exact how right now, I promise you, it's discoverable, it's doable, and it's possible. It's really just about sometimes reaching out and getting the help that you need to see these possibilities. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's usually when everyone asks, asks me this kind of question at the end of a podcast, like what else would you tell people? I always talk about community or mentorship because that's really what got me moving forward in my career when I was stuck because I was so stuck in my own bubble. I was stuck in my own circumstances. I couldn't see outside of that and getting those outside perspectives and those people that are just a little bit ahead of you or way ahead of you that can 
help open up those horizons to you, I think is really the key to moving forward in your career. If you stay in your own tiny little world, you probably will not go very far and you'll probably be stuck with all those, like you said, those tiny little options that are in, in the area around you that you can see that you might not like so much. (laughs) It is so very true. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been fantastic. Um, I would love to hear just a little bit about like, how do you help artists and then how other, other people can connect with you on social media? Thank you. Yeah. So the way that I love to support artists is through some of my online course offerings and my coaching. So I support artists in understanding how to find their core message and how to be able to write in a really articulate, coherent, impactful way. And I have courses that allow you to find your core message, courses that allow you to learn how to write, courses that allow you to really clarify your mission and your purpose here. Um, as well as for the artist who wants to understand how to make money in these creative ways, how to crowdfund, how to get wild and wacky with income sources, how to balance multiple income streams and multiple businesses and really get into the nitty gritty of entrepreneurship and strategy. I offer both group and one-on-one mentorship. And you can find more information about this and get in touch with me at taradavina.com. That's T-A-R-A-D-I-V-I-N-A.com. Or you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and other platforms at Tara Davina. I love it. I love the idea of getting wild and wacky with income streams. That's pretty much what this podcast is all about. Uh, Opening up the minds of artists to all the ways that they can make income from music. So definitely very aligned with what we are doing here with our mission. Thank you so much, Tara. I really appreciate your time and expertise today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been beautiful to spend this time together. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.